Tonight, Sunwing passengers finally return home after days of chaos and frustration. Every day into the lobby. You spent the days in the lobby of your hotel? Every day. I can see you're like, you've been through it. I'm done. The demand for an explanation and accountability. People are connecting to have a class action lawsuit. The twisted aftermath of a deadly blow. Ukraine says it killed hundreds of Russian soldiers in a single strike. What that says about Ukraine's capability. This is the evidence. This is the evidence. A mysterious art theft still unsolved. It was right here. The plaque is still there. But the CBC's Paul Hunter has a critical clue. People were sending us pictures. You were one of them, Mr. Hunter. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. This is the day Sunwing Vacation said it expected to have most, if not all, delayed passengers back home after relaxing vacations turned into travel nightmares over the holidays. And we're certainly hearing a lot of stories from those travelers today about navigating canceled and delayed flights, searching for hotel rooms, and ending up in cities they never intended to visit. For people trying to get back to Saskatchewan, another layer of disruption. After Sun Wing mass canceled all flights to that province, Sam Sampson spoke to several people as they landed today about what they've been through and what they plan to do now. <laughs> this is a vacation friendship forged in frustration. And you take yeah. care of that way. Thank you. Sunwing canceled their flight home from Cuba to Regina on December 27th. They finally arrived Monday. I actually have a 13-year-old boy who suffers from some severe anxiety and um, he every day was crying like, are we going to get home? Are we ever going to get home? Hit by multiple snowstorms as Christmas approached, Sunwing cancelled flights across Canada. Then it announced it wouldn't fly in or out of Saskatchewan until February 3rd. Some passengers were forced to fly to Vancouver or Winnipeg, but those flights were delayed by up to six days. If they had told us five days, that would have been fine. Every day into the lobby. You spent the days in the lobby of your hotel? Every day. I could see you're like, you've been through it. I'm done. <laughs> Felt like abuse. Yeah. yeah. Val Lechner was sent from Cuba to Winnipeg. Instead of waiting for another flight to Regina, she rented a car. I didn't trust them. We had heard that so many times. They're coming, there's a plane, we promise, we promise. Sunwing says it initially tried to hire foreign pilots for the winter, but couldn't. The airline hasn't explained why Saskatchewan flights specifically were cut. They've declined several interview requests. <laughs> Passengers we spoke with said Sunwing didn't contact them about the cancellations and did not communicate well during delays. A no-no as far as federal legislation goes. Whether they're on the aircraft, stuck on a tarmac or whether they're in a hotel lobby in, um, in the Dominican Republic, they still have to correspond or communicate with um, their passengers constantly. Sunwing says passengers can apply for compensation through its website, but these new friends may take it a step further. People are connecting to have a class action lawsuit. Um, so by us being able to keep in touch, we'll be able to gather all the information that we have from our trip. See you guys. All they know now is their home. What a mess. So Sam, clearly some passengers are looking for accountability. I suppose the province is too. Yeah, the premier called the decision to cancel Sask flights irresponsible. And the province expects Sunwing to treat all of its customers fairly and for Ottawa to hold airlines accountable. We did reach out to Transport Canada for a comment. We have yet to hear back. Adrian? All right, Sam Sampson, thank you. So most stranded travelers are finally home, but it is a different story for lost luggage. As Deanna Sumnak Johnson tells us, thousands of bags still haven't made it to their destination. The holidays did not bring the family reunion Parham Zabedi hoped for. He never made it to Cincinnati, Ohio. Ten days ago, bad weather meant his flight was turned around mid-air. His luggage is still lost. Just yesterday, I got a phone call from someone in Cincinnati saying that, hey, your luggage is here. Uh, do you want to come and pick it up? So basically, I asked them to ship the luggage back and then still 
Nothing, uh, nothing from uh, Canada. Thousands of passengers who flew with Canadian Airlines over the holidays still don't have their bags. Many travelers shared pictures of bags dumped in locations around airports or more unusual spots like this one in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. In some places like Ottawa, bags are slowly making their way back to their owners. Other passengers are asking airlines for refunds for lost luggage. They're eligible for up to $1,000. Obviously, airlines um, uh, have to absorb these costs because uh, the traveler has entrusted them with uh, their belongings, in this case, a bag. You know, in some cases, uh, uh, the uh, airline can resort to um, insurance claims on their own. Uh, but, uh, you know, th this is really a cost of doing business. But money is not what Jordan Feist wants. The university student flew to Zurich to spend Christmas with her Swiss boyfriend. That was 18 days ago. One of her bags lost at Toronto's Pearson Airport still hasn't made it. It was pretty disheartening just because the one bag was filled with all my Christmas presents for my boyfriend and his family. She knows where the bag is just because she has a GPS tracker on it. The only information I get is from my air tag. Like I wouldn't even know it's in Montreal right now. The office of the Minister of Transport, Omar Al Gabra, said in a statement that they're in touch with airlines and airports about this situation. They also urge all affected passengers to file a complaint with the Canadian Transportation Agency. Though it's worth noting that that agency too is experiencing a backlog. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And Toronto's Sick Kids Hospital may have gotten a late holiday gift, a rare apology from a ransomware group, plus a promise to restore the hospital's hack systems for free. Sick Kids, the country's largest pediatric hospital, has been working to recover from a cyber attack. Now the hospital says it is aware of the statement issued online by a ransomware group that included an offer of a free decryptor to restore systems affected by the cybersecurity incident. SickKids added it's working with third-party experts to verify the claim and to access that decryptor. Ukraine has killed dozens of Russian soldiers in one of the deadliest counterattacks of the war so far. As Paul Hunter tells us, that strike says a lot about Ukraine's capabilities. In Russian-controlled eastern Ukraine, the site of what is among the deadliest strikes by Ukraine against Russian forces in this war. Dozens of Russian soldiers were housed in this building. At least 63 are dead. Ukraine says it's in the hundreds. In announcing the strike on its forces, a spokesman for Russia's defense ministry also underlined the weaponry was supplied by the U.S. Indeed, known as high mobility artillery rocket systems, seen here in photos from training programs in Latvia, the American rocketry is accurate, deadly, and for Ukraine, highly valued. This latest strike, a key setback for Russian forces. But at the same time, Russia continues its onslaught against Ukraine. This silent video showing more exploding drone attacks targeting Kiev. Many seeming to target Ukraine's energy infrastructure. As Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky put it, Russia is trying to weaponize winter. After these latest drone attacks, he said it's clear Russia hopes to exhaust Ukraine. They will fail, he said. A number of Ukrainians have been killed or injured in the latest strikes by Russia, but indeed the drone attacks have caused power outages, leaving countless more without heat as winter's cold continues. In his New Year's address, Russian President Vladimir Putin called 2022 a year of, quote, difficult, necessary decisions. But as 2023 begins, it's clear Ukraine remains unafraid, undaunted, and for now, well-armed. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Tens of thousands of people arrived at the Vatican to pay their respects to the late former Pope Benedict. He will lie in state at St. Peter's Basilica until his funeral on Thursday. This is the first Pope to be buried by his successor in at least a few hundred years. From Vatican City, Katie Nicholson shows us what to expect in the days ahead. A 95-year journey nearing its end. In solemnity and tradition. Just as Pope Benedict, a stickler for Catholic doctrine, would have liked it. 
Inside St. Peter's Basilica, Italian leaders among the first to visit the retired Pope in repose. Outside, lines formed around the perimeter of the plaza to say a final goodbye. When seeing that, we got goosebumps. You kind of feel quite more, more and more emotional as you get closer to, to viewing, um, you know, the Pope's body and, and realize the impact that he's had. It gave me a kind of comfort to say uh, he's laying in peace. Of the hundreds who have streamed through here, many are simply tourists, not necessarily people coming to pay respects to a Pope who's essentially been retired and out of the public eye for nearly 10 years. In many ways, this Pope, a stranger to a younger generation. I was pretty small and young when he was Pope. And for some tourists... Uh, the lineup's just too big. Not worth the wait. Nearly four million flock to the Vatican for the last papal funeral. Far fewer are expected on Thursday. Benedict's legacy has doubtless been overshadowed by the charismatic Pope Francis, but not among devout traditionalists. I think the generation to come will understand how big he was, how large his um, theology and his knowledge and his wisdom, all this, yes. I think this generation don't see really what he was. For me, he will be remembered as someone who, uh, as, a, as the true um, guardian of tradition. And while the crowds may be a little smaller, they will be no less devoted to the former Pope and his beloved tradition. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Vatican City. And fans from around the world gathered to pay their respects to the late soccer star Pele. <laughs> Thousands gathered at his hometown stadium in Santos, Brazil. The three-time World Cup winner died last Thursday at 82 years old following a colon cancer battle. He will be laid to rest tomorrow. And a mid-air crash between two helicopters has killed at least four people in Australia. This happened on a Gold Coast beach near SeaWorld at the height of tourist season. Police say one helicopter was taking off, the other was trying to land. Four people were killed and three others critically injured. Those involved were from Australia, New Zealand and the UK. A month after China reversed course on its COVID-0 policy, the World Health Organization is asking Beijing to reveal up-to-date data on COVID hospitalizations and deaths. China has become a bit of a pandemic black box. But Aaron Collins gives us a glimpse inside. This hospital in China's Sichuan province pushed to the brink. COVID patients here now triaged. This doctor says those who've stopped breathing or who have no heartbeat are prioritized. It's tough to know just how bad things are in China. Official numbers are hard to come by. Still, whispers of a growing crisis are trickling out. A lot of people are getting COVID. Born in Wuhan, Bin Zhang lives in Calgary now with his wife and two kids. But the rest of the family is still in China, dealing with this latest COVID wave. You know, the hospitals are pretty crowded. Um, you know, getting access to, to health care or even to medication seems to be a bit of a struggle nowadays. Responding to protests over harsh COVID restrictions last month, China abruptly reversed course, quickly relaxing rules, likely fueling this way. There's going to be infections and hospitalizations and uh, some cases even death. The current explosion in cases predictable for many experts. China has since uh, it's been now well over a month, a substantial wave uh, in a population that we know, generally speaking, was relatively under-vaccinated. As COVID cases ramp up in China, steps are being taken to limit the virus's spread outside that country. Starting Thursday, travelers from China will need a negative COVID test to fly to Canada, a move unlikely to stop the spread of the virus here. It's going to be very hard to kind of police borders in the context of people being able to travel so easily and, and, uh, and you know, mixing of populations as we had prior to the pandemic. Meanwhile, the COVID situation in China could soon get worse. The country is getting ready to celebrate the Lunar New Year, a holiday that will see millions of people travel around the country, many taking the virus with them. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary.
Well, the year is brand new, but it's already looking like another bumpy one for Canada's economy. Still, as Susanna De Silva reports, some are taking this news better than others. New year, new resolutions. It's just creating a new program for myself for strength, uh, for weightlifting. And some are being zen about the coming year. I thought 2022, there was, there was a lot of really bad things that happened, but a lot of things I think are getting better as well. And I'm really optimistic for how 2023 is looking. looking Unfortunately, it's an optimism year. not everyone shares. For we expect one third of the world economy to be in recession. Even countries that are not in recession, it would feel like recession for countries of, of millions of people. The International Monetary Fund is predicting slowdowns for the world's biggest economies, the EU, the US and China, now struggling with COVID, meaning possibly more supply chain problems as countries and consumers are already feeling pinched. Canadians are feeling high inflation, they're, they're feeling higher interest rates. The Bank of Canada says a recession could hit Canada too, and the pains Canadians felt last year could be worse for 2023, including more interest rate hikes, high inflation with high prices, some suggesting groceries could be up another 5 to 7 percent. There's been no growth in household real earnings. At the same time, they're seeing incredibly fast increase in their debt service payments, so expenses that they pay on their mortgages, on their consumer credits, different lines, lines of credits. And it's why many small businesses aren't feeling confident. We're at levels we haven't seen really outside of recession periods. Uh, it certainly shows that uh, it's not a strong economy right now. Fortunately, some businesses say the challenges of COVID mean they have learned to be flexible. I mean, we've dealt with so much in the last three years. It's just another shovel load on the pile. Like, it doesn't... It's not something I'm specifically reacting to. A lot of our, our members As he hopes really more people will come here people. to focus on something other than the economy. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Canadian victory at the World Juniors ran right through Team Slovakia. And tonight in Halifax, Team Canada took an overtime win of 4-3. to three. And again, Beautiful, but this was no cakewalk. Slovakia played rough, aggressive hockey, but could not neutralize Canada's immensely talented Connor Bedard. So Kate McKenna joins us now from Halifax with a great assignment. Kate, tonight a big night for Bedard in more ways than one. Absolutely. Canadians just watched World Juniors history. And what a night for 17-year-old Connor Bedard. He's on his way to rewriting history books. Slides in again. Bedard talks right in. It was a fairy tale ending for a historic night. 17-year-old Connor Bedard smashed three records and scored the winning goal in overtime. I've gone to the games and I've just seen him and he's been unreal. And we just think he's the next, uh, the next coming of Jesus. I think he's very slick and he's also very like humble about it. I think he like really appreciates all the support. In this game against Slovakia, he broke multiple records, including one held by Hall of Famer Eric Lindros. For 30 years, Lindros has held the record of all-time Canadian points at the World Juniors. Now, that honour belongs to Bedard. Lindros says he's happy to pass the torch. In a tweet before the game, he wrote, Happy New Year. Don't just break the record, Connor Bedard. Smash it. Win the tournament. Go Canada. Bedard broke two other records, too. He's now the all-time goal leader, and he now holds the record for most points scored in a single tournament. He's doing things at 17 that these players did at older ages. They were doing it at 18. Um, so it's, it's phenomenal from that perspective just to kind of watch history in the making. The budding superstar is projected to be the first pick in next year's NHL draft. Vancouver-born, he plays for the Regina Pats. And though he's only getting started, he's got a lot of fans. He's generational. He's got pretty much everything you're looking for in a, in a superstar. Lucky, I guess, that it's happening at the same time as I'm being able to watch and I'll remember it for a long time. Okay, so Kate, what, what happens next for Bedard and Team Canada? So now we're looking to Wednesday when Canada is going to play Team USA. And at that game, Bedard could beat or could win even more records. But of course, the main goal, what everyone is here for, is uh, winning gold and Team Canada, because of tonight, still in the mix for that. You bet. Kate McKenna, thank you.
A Saskatchewan First Nation is now the site of a major new renewable energy facility, the first of its kind to be Indigenous owned. These are very expensive projects to undertake and so without that assistance this project would not have happened. An exclusive look at the huge undertaking more than a decade in the works. Plus, who stole this famous Canadian portrait of Winston Churchill? It would have to be someone who had access, who was supposed to be there. Paul Hunter reveals how his own personal connection to the case could help solve it. And don't ever accuse this little guy of being just a house cat. Gary rides on my shoulders uh, as, we, as we ski down the hill. Hitting the slopes with this adventure-loving cat turned social media sensation, we are back in tune. Avengers star Jeremy Renner is in critical but stable condition after a snowplow accident Sunday. He's out of surgery after suffering a blunt chest trauma. No information has been released on the accident, but local police are investigating. The first Indigenous-owned bioenergy facility in Canada is now operating in northern Saskatchewan. It is part of the federal government's push towards clean energy. But as Bonnie Allen shows us, getting that kind of project off the ground isn't easy. So ultimately, those are the raw logs. Uh, coming in to North South. This sawmill in northwestern Saskatchewan turns logs into lumber, and for decades, it had a dirty habit. A quarter of each tree was simply wasted, burned, in what's known as a beehive burner, one of the last in Canada, notorious for spewing pollution. Okay. But not anymore. There is a substantial amount of waste. It used to go to the beehive. I don't know if you can kind of see it there. Yeah. Uh, but now it's all conveyed directly to us. The Meadow Lake Tribal Council is giving us an inside look at its newly constructed bioenergy centre. It turns leftover wood chips, bark and sawdust into heat and power. Pretty amazing, first and foremost, that this whole facility is 100% Indigenous owned. I can show you the, the fire itself in here, Bonnie. The leftover wood is still burned, but in a way that reduces emissions and generates energy. It's heating up thermal oil. 6.6 .6 megawatts of power is then sold to the provincial grid. Enough electricity for roughly 5,000 homes. Getting to this point has taken 14 years and $100 million. All that biomass ends up uh, in a bin. About half of that money came from Ottawa's green infrastructure program. These are very expensive projects to undertake, and so without that assistance, this project would not have happened. The pandemic and supply chain issues caused delays and cost overruns. There's also been a steep learning curve. Paul Q monitors everything from wood chips going in to power going out. It's good. It's, it's exciting. Like, see, now we got <coughs> alarm. Mitch, thermal oil, low flow. I gotta go check. All right. Thanks, you, Tom. Some bioenergy facilities are controversial. They cut down trees for the sole purpose of generating power. But not this one. The indigenous owners say they're just finding a way to use every fiber of the trees they've already harvested from their traditional land. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. Tonight, we're going to take you deeper into a mystery of an unsolved Canadian art heist in the heart of the nation's capital. It was right here. Somebody knew how to do it, knew how to remove it. So who stole this iconic wartime portrait and replaced it with a fake? The first thing I thought of was uh, it was an inside job. Paul Hunter follows the clues, including his own surprising personal connection to the case. And the secretive group working to sabotage a key ally of Vladimir Putin. I can face even capital punishment as cyberpartisans were marked as a terrorist group. Why Belarus isn't yet fully in the war. The inside story of those determined to keep it that way. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping your world. Next. Tonight, we are diving into the mystery of who stole a famous portrait of Winston Churchill, and we're looking at that mystery through a man who found himself inside the investigation, our very own Paul Hunter. Now, that portrait vanished from an Ottawa hotel around this time last year, 
And unbeknownst to him at the time, Paul held a crucial clue. He takes us through how it all unfolded. Waiting in the evidence room at a securitized police warehouse in suburban Ottawa, and there it is. That's it. The phony Churchill. Let's take a look. The faked photo of Winston Churchill, a key clue in Canada's art heist of the century. This is the evidence? This is the evidence that uh, was recovered from the scene. Wow. Now discolored by forensic chemicals, CBC News was given special access to what has now been scoured for fingerprints and DNA. A scrawled, forged signature and Churchill's hand, the only signals now on view that this was meant to be that. One of the most iconic portraits of the last hundred years, known as the Roaring Lion, a vintage photo of the British Prime Minister after a wartime speech in Ottawa. When I warned them that Britain would fight on alone. Taken by Canada's Yusuf Karsh in 1941. Stoic, purposeful, resolute, stolen. The still unsolved mystery began here, at a castle of a hotel in downtown Ottawa, the Chateau Laurier. Karsh himself once worked and lived here. He gifted the Churchill and others to the hotel as a thank you. And for decades, it hung alongside some of his other photographic masterpieces right out in the open for all to see and enjoy until it was taken. Every day someone? Every day. People come and ask, where was it? What happened? Did you find it? Every day. Really? Hotel manager Geneviève Dumas can still hardly believe the Churchill's gone. It was right here. The plaque is still there. Holes in the wall and a brass nameplate is pretty much all that's left. A swap happened, and there's special anchors. It was bolted on four anchors, so somebody knew how to do it, knew how to remove it. I don't know. One big clue, the fake left behind by the thief. This is it back when it was on the wall. It was only last August that a hotel staffer noticed the frame was too dark. Here's an old photo of the original. In hindsight, it's easy to see the difference. On the left, the original frame is gold, not brown. On the right, the fake is overall smaller. But for months, no one noticed. So when this happened, we asked for anybody that had pictures of Churchill to find Hotel a guests yeah. sent in photos they'd taken, hoping that it would help crack the case. The most recent shot of the original in place was this one from Christmas Day 2021. People were sending us pictures. You were one of them, Mr. Hunter. I had the fake. The right? latest original was uh, December 25th. So when you sent us that picture of the fake on January 6th, we know that it disappeared between December 25th and January 6th. That's right. The photo of the print, the first known photo of the fake, was taken by me. Why? Well, it all goes back to my late mother who in the 1950s helped get Churchill re-elected in the UK, after which he sent her a signed letter of thanks, which became a family heirloom, and for years stood alongside a copy of Akarsh at our home in Toronto. Whenever I'm in Ottawa, I'd stop by the hotel to see the vintage Roaring Lion, so that I could, in a sense, say hi to my mum. And last January, I took this picture, not knowing that months later, by fluke, it would narrow the window for the theft to just 12 days. And here's another clue. This is the lobby just recently, next to the room with all the photos. This is the lobby around the time the Karsh was stolen in another shot that I took on that trip. Ottawa was in a COVID lockdown. 
perfect timing, says ex-FBI agent Robert Whitman in Philadelphia, who years ago founded the FBI's Art Heist Division. That to me would be opportunity. A but valuable photo in a near empty person? hotel. What went through your mind when you heard about the Karsh theft in Ottawa? Well, the first thing I thought of was uh, it was an inside job. It would have to be someone who had access and who was supposed to be there. When it comes to these and things, savvy enough to hang that fake in its place. In the world of art crime, he says, fakes are a key tool. It's not a good reproduction, but that's all it takes because people aren't looking specifically at that. The casual observer is not going to see that's not the original. Fakes, he says, are meant to buy time for the thief. Most people won't see the difference, at least not at first. It just has to be close enough. Close enough. Words. Eventually, he says, most stolen art comes onto the market. And when that happens... Someone talks about it. Uh, they tell the wrong person. The wrong person turns around, tells the police, and then there's an undercover operation to recover it. That said, it's a process that can take years. Meanwhile, say those who know this stuff, the world has lost a piece of history. In the president's wing at the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery in Washington, familiar faces are framed on wall after wall after wall. And in a special room brought out just for us, a prime minister. Another rare, made by Karsh himself, Roaring Lion. Smaller than the one stolen in Ottawa, cherished by curator Anne Schumard. It's an artifact of that moment. And I think that's one of the things that makes it special. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is, it's extraordinary. Schumard underlines Karsh prints are always of value, but the Churchill itself is special. Not least with its backstory, Churchill's cigar snatched away by Karsh moments before the photo, bringing that now famous scowl. It made Karsh's career. I mean, up until that point, he was really not known um, outside of Canada. It became the most well-known of really of all of his portraits over time. If someone, even if they don't know the name Karsh, if they think about Winston Churchill, this is probably the image that comes to mind. When you think of Churchill, you think of this. You think of this. So this was the Karsh apartment. They lived here. They did. The monster. For 20 years. It's beautiful. It is gorgeous. Back at the chateau, Geneviève Dumas takes us into the rarely seen rooms where Karsh spent so many years. I see Hemingway, George Bernard Shaw. His work, icons all on every wall, underlining for Dumas what's been lost. It needs to be shown to the world. It needs to come back here where it belongs. I'm sincerely hoping this will reach someone who knows what happened and this will make the picture to come back. You sound so frustrated. Yes, I'm frustrated. This is part of this hotel. It's part of the history. It's part of Canada, of Ottawa. It belongs here. All right. Thank you. And with that, Ottawa police take the fake into the back room. Their investigation remains active, but the roaring lion remains gone. Mr. Hunter, you are a deep well. This, this story could only happen to you. <laughs> I wonder, um, you know, now that you're so tight with the police about all this, what, what are they telling you about that investigation? Uh, well, you know, the, the investigation is indeed still active, Adrian. I mean, police tell us they've been sent multiple leads by multiple people. We did ask if they've ruled out that it might be an inside job, but police wouldn't say one way or the other, citing the ongoing investigation. The hope, and this point was made by everyone we spoke with, is that a renewed spotlight on the theft could you know, trigger something. It's like our ex-FBI art heist investigator told us, loose lips can often lead to resolution in these things. Everyone agrees this theft represents a significant loss for Canada. Police emphasize tips can be made privately. The key, they say, is simply to get the Churchill back, Adrian. 
No kidding. Let's get it home. Thank you for this, Paul. You're welcome. The amazing Paul Hunter. Now, if Russia is successful in its war on Ukraine, some fear other countries might be next. The next steps, as they announced before, could be Poland, could be Lithuania, could be Latvia, and the way to do it is through Belarus. Up next, inside a highly secretive network of hackers and the Belarusian dissidents risking their lives to stop Russia in its tracks. Looks a bit intimidating, doesn't it? Which is kind of the point. This is a new police unit in Belarus for what it calls internal threats, a sign maybe of what is worrying the authoritarian ruler in Belarus. So his country sits just above Ukraine, and like Ukraine, it is nestled right between several NATO countries to the west and Russia to the east. For Moscow, Belarus is a key ally. Russia uses it as a base and staging area. But Belarusian troops haven't joined Putin's invasion. We were curious, why is that? Some of it, it seems, comes down to espionage, sabotage, and sacrifice. This is the ever boastful Russian Ministry of Defense, recently showing off urban warfare training underway in Belarus. A warning to all, really, that Belarus could soon get very involved in the war next door. Frightening, only that's been the threat for almost a year and is yet to happen. Why not? Well, here's a clue. Shredded Belarusian rail lines, the very lines used by Russians for tanks and troops. Not an accident, sabotage, and not a one-off event. They hacked the Belarusian railways and turned off the optimization system. Uh, they brought down a lot of viruses to the networking systems uh, when uh, Russian troops were trying to attack Kiev and Kiev area. Yuliana Shmetovets is the spokesperson for Cyber Partisans. That's a group of self-taught Belarusian hackers so secretive even she doesn't know their identities. Working with other saboteurs, some have managed to snarl the operations of their own country's authoritarian leader, Alexander Lukashenko, Putin's ally, who after nearly 30 years in office, happily calls himself Europe's last dictator. The saboteurs want both of them stopped. If he's, um, God forbid, successful in Ukraine, the next steps, as they announced before, could be Poland, could be Lithuania, could be Latvia, and the way to do it is through Belarus. They claim to have successfully hacked the passports of every citizen in Belarus, made an NFT of Lukashenko's passport to sell and fundraise off of. Some saboteurs use drones to attack Belarusian police stations, but dictators don't tolerate dissent. Videos from the Belarusian Interior Ministry show harsh takedowns of suspects, some reportedly even shot in the knees. Punishments Shmatovets thinks about even from her home in New York. I can face capital punishment as several partisans were marked as a terrorist group. This work is hard, trying to both protect Ukraine and untangle themselves from a dictator's web. Ustala. Consider Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, a teacher who ran for president after her husband was arrested and she won, or seemed to. Lukashenko, the dictator, wasn't having it, claimed victory, sent riot police into the streets. Tikhonovskaya was so threatened she fled in the middle of the night. We are getting reports that the main opposition candidate might be missing. The whole world left wondering what happened to her. When the Belarus was dragged into this war... When she now lives and fights in exile. Made her way late last year to the Halifax Security Forum. So we met up to talk of her country's precarious place and her decision to flee. That decision you made must have been one of the hardest decisions of your life. When you are put, a woman put in front of the choice, you know, safety of children and stay in the country, you know, of course, at that moment, my internal mother win. Have you come to a place where you are, you've made peace with making that decision? No, I still uh, wondering if I could do differently. 
everything was so chaotic. Reject Lukashenko's fraudulent and deadly regime. And the second guessing may stalk her, but it's also freed her to get loud and travel. Coming to Canada was key. She lobbied for and succeeded in getting sanctions. It's a clear political message uh, to Belarusians that they are not alone in this fight. I wonder what it what it feels like now that so much attention is on Ukraine. I don't want to compete for attention because uh, we are fully support uh, uh, all this attention on Ukraine because they are defending uh, democratic values we are fighting for as well. But of course, uh, I want the world not to overlook the responsibility of Lukashenko for dragging our country into this war. <laughs> This is a bit of an internal struggle. How to fight for Ukraine, of course, but still save some passion and resources for protecting the people of Belarus. In Toronto, the leader of the Belarusian Canadian Alliance, Alena Leonvanchanka, feels it deeply. It's kind of hard to find the line. Uh, are, am I egoistic and pushing my agenda too much when such crimes and terrors are happening in Ukraine? For this group, fighting doesn't look like cyber hacking or sabotage. As much as they know and applaud those efforts, their battle is strictly telling people that their country is under the thumb of Russia and wants out. We cannot go to Belarus. Basically, most of us are banned and would be arrested or our families would be in danger. So what we can do, we can make it public. Belarusians and migrants are now hostages of the regime. And the woman who would be president, determined to keep pressing Western governments to remember what happens in Ukraine, won't stop in Ukraine. Suspend the so uh, are you ready you know, to defend Belarusians um, after Ukraine will win? Of course, we are not asking you to, you to do our work our job, but we need assistance, we need energy, we need understanding that we are not forgotten, we are not abandoned. And to try to ensure Vladimir Putin doesn't further use or abuse their Belarus. Now, even the threat that Belarus might get more involved in the war is worrying enough for Ukraine that it is bolstering its defenses on its northern border with the country, taking troops and weapons away from places where it may need them more. So keep an eye on Belarus. Coming up on The National, something a little different to lift your spirits. It's Gary, isn't it? <laughs> Gary, we love you. I never really expected to stumble into having an internet famous cat. Well, you do now. We will show you why Gary is the coolest cat on the slopes in our moment. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, 10 months into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a look at the consequences of the war, changing strategies and plans for peace. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, this is Gary. Gary, obviously a cat, not only an adventurous little guy, also apparently an internet sensation with hundreds of thousands of followers. So one of his owners, Alberta man James Eastham, has been taking Gary pretty much everywhere, from serene lakes to the icy slopes. And tonight, Gary's sense of adventure is our moment. About four years ago now, there was a big storm. We got snowed into our house, and so Gary would still want to go outside, and we decided to take him out. And I thought, when would I get the chance to ski with my cat again? So we did a couple small laps on that. The next year, Nikiska was looking for social media partners, so threw my name in the hat, and uh, the rest is sort of documented. It's Gary, isn't it? It's Gary, we love you. <laughs> Gary rides on my shoulders uh, as we as we ski down the hill. On um, the chairlift, he's got a little backpack that he rides in. If I haven't taken Gary out enough, he sits at the door and screams at me. Most of what we do with Gary is skiing, but it's it's hiking. He's been to the top of a bunch of different mountains. He's even walked on the Athabasca Glacier. He's been inside the Pato Glacier. There's a little ice cave there. We also do a lot of paddling, so he just sits on the front and, and naps in the sun. And then occasionally in the winter, we go out for a ski. So the first thing James says is, please don't do this at home. It might not end well if you just grab your cat and put it in a knapsack. 
Gary, he insists, has had a fantastic life, was a rescue uh, from Calgary where he was found with a broken hip and fixed up, and Gary adopted him, and apparently he is living life large. That is a national for January the 2nd. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.